Good morning, everybody. Now that Jamila has a butter the biscuits, <laughs> I guess I was, I'll probably stay behind the court. I don't know what would come over me if I go out there. I'll stay. I'll be careful. I'll be careful. So, you know, I think it's well in this diversity that is being presented and everything, and, and it's so important in this heart-mind situation that is a lot of what this is about and it's very important for us to hear people's hearts you know sing out in here and there's not enough of that in science and medicine and healthcare and institutions etc cetera, etc cetera. that's very true and that's very real and it's really important and then you know in a more kind of like team approach than some of my work because then I'm, I'm down there I'm in Sarah when I just got back from the Amazon and you know, we're in ceremony with ayahuasca, and so yeah, I just let it all hang out, out there. And then part of my job and my work here in the States is to help people walk from the mind to the heart, you know, from this academic understanding and how do we let these, how do we reach people, you know, yes, we can reach them directly heart to heart, and then sometimes people need something to wrap their head around, you know, to walk their way down into um, some of these spaces. And so how do we, when we want to talk about the way the energy comes into us and the energy that we experience and that's very real and that science maybe is, doesn't know what to do with and the way that touches our hearts and our emotional beings and how real that is. And then how does that connect, you know, to these understandings of, of mind and body, you know, that are floating around in academia? You know, where does the spirit touch the flesh? In, in a way that we could uh, understand and articulate or at least talk about. So that's what my, you know, interest is. And so that's what the talk, illuminating, so psychedelic medicine. So for me, it was like ayahuasca shamanism, but then also getting involved in this with MDMA. That this psychedelic medicine is illuminating the interface between biology, emotion, and spirituality. And that's the bridge. You know, that emotion is the bridge into what we're feeling and what we're singing and calling out and receiving from the energy, from the ancestors, etc. And there's a, there's a biology that we already know about around emotion and fear and anger and attachment and all these kind of things. So that's it. This was, I just throwing this out there because I'm here with Belinda, my friend, you know, from Arizona. And um, she's coming as, you know, a Diné woman, Zuni woman. And coming to kind of bring the message from the Amazon, from you know, my family's from Colombia, South America. And my teachers and ayahuasca are she peoples from the Amazon. And so for us, and this is what Jamila also touched on, is the, the spiritual context. You know, that to be able to, and, and you know, MAPS has been done a great job of trying to articulate things in a secular enough way to not ruffle enough feathers that it starts to enter the lexicon. You know, that we can start talking about whether it's the mindfulness or the inner, I don't know, I was the inner healer or the beginner's mind, you know, and start finding words and then allow the people from these other cultures, from our cultures, to come unabashedly and say, this is spiritual, you know, this is spiritual. And so, you know, when we did the Arizona Psychedelics Conference a little while ago, you know, one of the points Belinda was making was, how come spirit is always supposed to catch up to the science? You know, like that's exactly what's wrong. That's exactly why our society is suffering and is misguided. Is that, that the most holistic element is left last. And so I, you know, you were talking nothing against Berkeley, but it was just another classic example. The Hearst Museum of Berkeley had the saying, the play, you know, there are worlds of mind altering substances, pleasure, poison, prescription, and prayer. Prayer is always at the end, you know. <laughs> The last thing to, to talk about. And so then, you know, we're coming from Arizona, and I'm traveling with, with Belinda in this Diné country, you know, Navajo country, and there's the, the Grand Canyon. And one of our friends there, Daryl Slim, is a, is a Navajo uh, medicine man, Diné medicine man. So he says that, like, as we try to figure things out, when we have this mind, body, emotion, energy, spirit, mysticism, etc., that really spirit is first that we should be putting spirit first. Because spirit, or the mystery, or however we want to talk about it, we don't need to get so hung up on the words, because we're trying to communicate, we're trying to share our experience. So what I'm calling spirit, this moment that we experience, 
okay, the totality of our living experience, this moment, that's the spirit. We, 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 we feel that. So the, our feeling, which through our body, is how we come to know, you know, that we are alive. And that's how we come to know the experience of spirit. And so then our mind is simply a reflection on that experience. And our body is, you know, we're feeling more reacting. Our mind is simply a reflection. The most important thing is how we feel, because that's the reality of how we're responding to this moment of, of, of being alive. So healing people's feeling is so important to help them uh, experience unity. That's what's blocking them, you know? This baggage, emotional baggage, different things that are cluttering up their emotional being is what's keeping them from being able to feel faith. That's what it is. And so when you heal people this way, at this deep soul level, very commonly, they wake up spiritually. They start you know, having experiences of, of the connectedness of all things and understanding their place in this world, in this life. They're no longer ashamed of being alive, of being born. And they start connecting to nature, for example. So that's really important, spirit first. So this is my background, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, family medicine, I did some research in uh, mind-body medicine, and I, I spent, since 2007 till now, I've been studying two people, traditional Amazonian plant medicine, and what we call ayahuasca shamanism or curanderismo, and then I helped found a healing center in Peru, and I just got back, we just got back from there. And uh, I worked there, uh, working with people, Westerners from all over the world to, to treat them, and then I, um, I went through the apprenticeship to run ceremony, and I run ayahuasca ceremony myself now, in Shipibo uh, tradition, under my teacher, Ricardo. And then now I have an organization, Modern Spirit, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to demonstrating the value of spiritual healing in modern healthcare. And so we have a project right now with MAPS, which I'll touch on at the end. This is just the Maloka, the ceremonial space at New Erao. And uh, where we practice traditional people medicine, these are naturopathic medical students. We've been bringing medical students and doctors. We just had a group of doctors and scientists, psychologists come through. B and I led a group to Zoltera in Costa Rica earlier this year of therapists, psychotherapists, to show them traditional medicine, traditional psychedelic medicine, to connect them and give them the opportunity to connect. This is my teacher, um, Ricardo Maringo. This is uh, New Erao, our little tree. This is Shipibo, they call it Kenne. Kenne is the designs that the Shipibos, they embroider on all their clothing, like what I'm gonna have on my, on my shirt, from the visions. It's from the visions. For us, it's the visualization of the plant medicine energy. So when you see that you're connected to the energy, you draw from that. So then the song, the Ikaro, is also drawn from that energy. So there's a relationship between the, the visualized form of the energy and the song. This is ayahuasca being cooked. First time I ever went to Peru, this guy was wearing a Phoenix Suns hat. It's just crazy. I'm from Phoenix. He didn't know what it was. This is the center in Peru. This is where our center is. It's on the edge of a national forest. So this Amazon that, that Izzy was talking about, you know, is under threat and it's still a gigantic ocean of, of green. And we're right on the edge of hundreds of kilometers of forest. So I wrote a book that was, you know, it's in the map, it's in the maps bookstore. I'm trying to get people to look at it and therapists to look at it and penetrate the culture. It's called The Fellowship of the River. And so what my book is about is, is, is about my journey into this medicine and, and all that. But it's also about what were people coming down there for? Why did people from Western world, America, come into the middle of the Amazon to seek healing? What weren't they getting from their culture? What weren't they getting from their healthcare system? What did they find there? And so it's, to me, I'm not about everyone drinking ayahuasca or even everyone doing psychedelics. Like, I'm not even worried about that at all. But what I'm most interested in is the kind of healing these people find. And what, was, what did they find? Because they might be able to find it a lot of different ways. And what they found was they found a healthcare system that acknowledged the emotional and spiritual dimensions of their illness. You know, un, without any embarrassment on those topics, you know, without shying away from those topics. The native way is just clear. That's just obvious. As we all know, as we all feel it in our hearts and in our lives, 
if you don't acknowledge how you feel, and you don't acknowledge the way you believe, you know, your existence is meeting the world, and that that has something to do with your health, you're going to have a lot of problems. And that's where we're at in our healthcare system right now. And we're struggling with PTSD and anxiety, and so now we're starting to get to more expansive approaches. So I saw this Netflix, um, this, this thing's going to run out of batteries, the computer. Do you need a cord? I mean, yes. I mean. They're bringing, okay. Yeah. Anyways, that, I guess, I don't know. The maps team are just scrambling around. Joel, this is your moment. <laughs> it's Camille, okay, we'll find Camille. We'll find Camille. Text her, telephone. Oh, okay, it's not, I don't know, we're probably okay, and we'll just continue, but just throwing it out. <laughs> so, this Netflix is called Skyladder, I saw it, and it's about, it's about the story of this uh, Chinese fireworks artist. He's like the avatar, he's the guru of, you know, fireworks, which China is like, uh, you know, the motherland, and he's the top guy. He did the Beijing Summer Olympics, so he's the guy. And he just loves fireworks, and he loves it, and he has dreams about fireworks, and he has this dream. The movie is about him realizing his dream to create this sky ladder. Yeah, we'll deal with it. It doesn't read. Uh, sky ladder. And he wanted to create the sky ladder. And so he was talking about art, how art is so important. He says, as an artist, art is so important. So art is indicating and addressing the invisible world. That's its, its role and its purpose. And that's what this, he's trying to bring his imagination to life out there and visualize it with the fireworks. And so he says feng shui, you know, feng shui from China is very interesting and important because it indicates and addresses the invisible world. So she, people can, like I was showing you, you know, these are the, these are the visions from ayahuasca, from the plant medicine. And for us, it's like those are the lessons we learn from that energy. And so they, they see that from the visions from the invisible world and they put it on all their clothes and they paint it on their house. And it's indicating and addressing this invisible world. It becomes present. Um, so observed in ayahuasca visions, embroidered in cloth, here she people can paint it on the face. Sometimes people see that. They see people, their face, you know, when the, the person has died at a lot of plants, and their face is all kind of, so then they paint their face to make it real and remind people about these things that so often are invisible. So feng shui indicates and addresses the invisible world. So in Chinese mythology, feng shui is a system, this is from Wikipedia, spiritual energies, both good and evil, present in the natural features of landscapes. So they're saying that these are the invisible forces that shape the landscape. Feng shui, I guess it means something like wind and water. This is the invisible energy that shapes the creation, that makes the wind blow this way and makes the river flow that way. And so, it's not just about, feng shui is not just about an aesthetic that we're trying to achieve an aesthetic, oh, I like the way that looks. It's trying to be in alignment with the energies that shape nature, that are very much part of our life and part of our existence. And so it's indicating and addressing these invisible forces. You know, this morning I went down to the river, to the Ohio River over here. I've been curious to go because I'm just interested because that's this river system that feeds into the Mississippi and everything over here is the big... It is the big infrastructure that supports, you know, all the life here and all the human civilization that's been here for thousands of years revolves around that river. And interestingly enough, like I think, you know, the maps, little team, maps team, it would be nice to squeeze it in somewhere in there um, about the Sassafras. You know, so the, the indigenous cultures here, they work with the Sassafras tree. You know, and I was just reading a little bit on Wikipedia today, and apparently the, you know, the European interest in the sassafras tree was quite significant. The flavor and the aroma and different uses, including medicinal uses. But it drew a lot of people into the interior. They said, like, so they had a quote from Columbus. They said, oh yeah, we knew we were getting close to America because you could smell the sassafras. And it's these forests around here, in the Midwest and to the Northeast, that the sassafras is very present. And I guess the root bark is the source of the saffron, which continues to be one of the, there are other sources, but that's one of the major sources 
of MDMA. And so it would be nice while we're here to honor that tree, yes. you know, that's here with us and it's part of what, and the cultures that taught everybody that's here for this, how to work with that plant, which is the indigenous cultures of this area and, and the extension. So there's a lot of invisible forces when we talk about invisible forces that the scientific world recognizes, like electromagnetic forces that we don't normally see, but we can visualize, you know, with magnets and things like that. So we do accept that there's things that we don't normally see that influence our world. The EKG, you know, as a doctor, is the electromagnetic field generated by the heart that they say you can measure out maybe three feet away from a person, and that, you know, another human being likely is able to detect uh, that field. So art is very important and addresses the invisible world, that which we can feel and experience but not always measure. So back to that again, what we can feel and experience but not always measure. You know, where science kind of likes, it's a little uncomfortable in that realm. Curanderismo, spiritual healing techniques, also address invisible worlds, invisible causes, invisible sources of aid aimed at achieving harmony. So this is just like multi-dimensional, this is candy on somebody's face on a pot, you know, where they can store ayahuasca, just the multiple dimensions. This is a little artwork by a guy from Phoenix, from Mesa El Mac, he's a graffiti artist, and his art kind of reminds me of a lot of things I see in ayahuasca, you know, this imaginal realm that he's reaching into and drawing from, that's influencing his, you know, what he wants to express. So scientists struggle with the mysteries of life, sometimes discouraging the acknowledgement of our feelings, our subjective experience. Limiting discussion to our, quote, mental. Mental is an extremely, like, arbitrary, mystical concept. Okay, we talk about it like it's this secular thing, mental. We don't, it's like a mystery that I can think where my thoughts are coming from, that the words are coming out of my mouth talking to you. As far as we understand, that is a miracle. That is the current, like, understanding. Traditional healers are artists. They do not distinguish themselves from the mysteries of life. You know, so Jamila is bringing this art right forward. Here is my spirit, here is my soul, here I am. And yes, I have a mind and I can handle this information. But I also feel I'm alive. So psychotherapists are also artists addressing the invisible influence of emotional traumas and of our belief systems on our mental and physical health. So where do these energies touch the flesh? This, these invisible energy. So I'm talking about invisible energy, emotional trauma, as an invisible energy that's lingering in the person, and their belief system, the energy of that. Where does that touch the flesh? And see the kind of energy from the, the plants. We see Chinese meridians, you know, other systems of, of uh, medicine where they're addressing energetic uh, realities. And so then there's the traditional Amazonian plant medicine that I studied, the Shupibo style, in, in Iquitos, Peru. And this certain, you know, in the book I ended up presenting a bunch of cases of different people. Can I get a little water from somebody? Right there. Oh, there. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is the basic protocol. It's like we have the 12-week protocol, the MAPS protocol. People are put into this vegetalista diet. They're put on this purifying diet. You know, as explained more in the book, they're they're dieting master plants that are ne not necessarily psychoactive, but are there for their spiritual properties. And then they come to ayahuasca ceremony, and so they they receive the ayahuasca if they want to, and then they're treated with with ikaros, okay, just like the therapist is present with the person and walking them through the experience. It's not just taking the substance. They go a lot further when you have one of these masters from the MAPS team walking you through it. So glorifying the substance, the cult of the substance, is not really the whole story. You know, I work with ayahuasca. We don't make a cult of the ayahuasca. We respect ayahuasca. You know, that's to dishonor the plant, to not bring what you bring to it and your role as a healer, to be there with people and to really be honest about what it takes to hold people to help them through that. It's a lot more than just giving it to them. So, treating people this way with this kind of medicine 
we ended up achieving a lot of mental and physical healing, so-called mental and physical healing. So people were resolving a lot of psychological disturbances as uh, characterized by Western terms, you know, their anxiety, their depression, et cetera, et cetera, their thinking problems. And then there's even physical healings that happen. I described migraine headache healing and psoriasis healing and asthma healing and um, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease healing. So that this, like, we're just doing this spiritual approach with people, with the plants, and they're getting mental response and physical response. So these are some of the cases I present in the book. I present a PTSD case, and I already mentioned some of the other ones, but there's a chronic cough, an addiction case. So as a family medicine doctor, I'm seeing this big, broad diversity of illnesses that is getting healed with all the same techniques. I mean, they're using different plants, we're using different plants, but the bulk of the treatment is similar. And so I said, wow, these things must have some kind of related physiology. You know, I'm a doctor, and when the same problem is fixed with the same solution, different problems with the same solution, then those problems have something in common. So I'm like, what is common between these issues? And as we explore, the, you know, the cases down there, well, it was, it was emotional trauma. It was emotional trauma that was healed in these people that led to, through a spiritual context, so realizing that the spiritual context, or at least some kind of expanded consciousness context, is, is so powerful in helping to heal emotional trauma. And that's just the you know, old earth wisdom, that ritual and ceremony and creating these expanded spaces is where people really learn to grieve and forgive and heal and find self-love again, you know, find compassion. Those kind of contexts are apparently more effective. So we're treating the seemingly invisible elements of our experience. That's what's going on. That's why these people are coming down there to Peru. And so their emotional experience and their spiritual lives. At the very least, if we're trying to secularize it or put it in things that could be published or that have been published, it's like their sense of meaning and purpose in life and in their belief system. So where do these emotional and spiritual influences touch the flesh? Like kind of how we started out here. Where does this touch the flesh? Can we measure this stuff? Why we're so worried about measuring everything to make it feel real to us? I mean, yes, we can feel it. You know, you're going to feel the energy of this or that, but we're trying to crack the matrix, right? We, we're trying to crack that. And they, they want something, you know. They, they're materialists. Like, they, they love that. It's, that is their religion. They believe in that over other things. When the material, so when the material explanation hits its border, of like oh, up until that, we know they put their faith in that. They say, yeah, well, whatever, we're going to figure it out later. But it's still going to be from that. But they still take a leap of faith, like all the other, you know, poor suckers walking around. But they don't admit it. You know that it's a faith walk that they're on with the materialism. So, but still, it is interesting, and we are, you know, I have a body, and I'm okay with that. I mean, where it's, maybe it's all an illusion and a maya, but here we are, we decided to come up here to this floor and use an elevator. <laughs> so, meanwhile, <laughs> and so what is it? Where is, where can we find the related physiology and biochemistry of spiritual healing? When somebody, when the ancestor is touched down and somebody has a major physical healing, or at least a major emotional healing, that leads to, let's say, a resolution of a PTSD type of diagnosis, and you see a difference in the way their body functions after that, like, can we learn about that? So that's, you know, the book is about that. And um, I say the patient is the bridge. You know, as we try, again, to try to bridge these worlds of spiritual tradition and Western science. And so it was all Joe, aren't you going crazy? You know, drinking ayahuasca and talking at the university and it's like maybe a little bit crazy. <laughs> but instead of me trying to figure it out and everyone trying to figure out the answer of trying to understand where we integrate spiritual healing and medical illness is the patient. The patient tells the story. So then the book is about reviewing people's experience where you have 10 people and say, oh, look, here's somebody, here's what the doctor said was wrong with them. 
Here's what the shaman said was wrong with them. Here's what happened to them during their healing. And now here's what the doctor can say about that. And here's what the shaman can say about that. And here's what the patient is going to say. And so then that's, in looking at things that way, it was like, wow, it was an emotional trauma healing stories. That's what it was most of the time. So there's this mind-body that is kind of the Western is comfortable with, but there's also this other pair, you know, that the Diné people talk about, and many people talk about, all the, you know, the, the, whether it's Ayurveda or um, Chinese medicine, is there's an emotion-energy pair as well, okay? That, that our emotional being is the one that feels into the mystery. It is the one that picks up on mm, energetic phenomena. And that's how we feel those things. And that's how we're aware of those things. It's through our body, and our heart is central to that. And then you have other systems that are describing a chakra system, you know, that are, that are interacting. And the Shoe peoples, for example, are very, very comfortable with the chakra system. You know, it fits into what they're seeing in the ayahuasca. Emotional body, so what is the emotional body in Western terms? Well, it's the medium through which we experience uh, emotion and feeling. So that's, that's physical, there's a medium through which we experience emotion and feeling. This is just a Finnish study where they asked a bunch of people, subjectively, where do you feel these emotions? And then they overlaid all the maps of what everyone said and tried to find some kind of, you know, consensus. Well, this is where they feel anger, you know, from here up. This is where they feel happiness throughout. You know, love in the heart, in the mind, and down below. <laughs> So the emotional body, so then my, one of my points of the book is that the emotional body is something that we are now, we should be comfortable talking about in Western science. That there is a medium through which we feel emotion and it's been described a lot. And to me, it is this network that I learned about in mind-body research, right, where they started out as psychosomatic medicine. Psychosomatic was like a field of medicine, a lot of stress-related illness that they're always trying to study. How can one people get depressed? They're, they don't heal as well. They're sick more often. How come um, stress leads to these, all these illnesses? So this connection, you know, that's been a big focus of psychosomatic medicine. And, and then they started creating this, they looked at psycho and neuroimmunology. So they said, oh, there's this network of how your mind is and your psychology is connected to your brain and actually to the emotional centers in your brain. And then the way that that system is wired into your autonomic nervous system that's doing all this automatic functioning and making you blush or making you cry or making you laugh or making you throw up or affecting your digestion, you know? Feel a pit in your stomach or a lump in your throat. And so all that stuff affecting your breathing, you know, how you're gonna respond. All that kind of stuff. And so that is also very connected in a very, um, unified way to certain elements of the endocrine system, the hormonal system, okay, the cortisol system, the fight or flight, cortisol, hormones, adrenaline, other things, and the immune system, certain parts of the immune system, certain inflammatory responses. So we see all this excess inflammation in stressed out people, you know, rooted in their emotional experience. So their emotional body, this psychoneural endocrine immunologic network, so there's just those, the elements of the autonomic nervous system, the hormones, there's more talk about different the mind-body relationship, you know, the HPA axis that, that I think Jamila even mentioned, or did you mention I thought she did somewhere in there. Was, there was a lot, but I heard, I heard HPA axis. Um, is this fight or flight system, the stress response system of the body. So that would be an example of a core element of the emotional body. And so there's tons of evidence how emotional trauma leads to dysfunction of the HPA axis. And then we can show how profound emotional healing leads to alleviation of, of uh, HPA axis dysfunction and brings it back into healthier function. Normal cortisol, whatever, cycles, you know, morning cortisol levels, the swing of that, that a healing would influence that and an emotional trauma would, would disturb it. This is just papers, I'm not going to get into it, but just, you know, these are referenced in the book and elsewhere, just examining the crux of autonomic dysfunction and PTSD. 
endocrine aspects of PTSD, implications for diagnosis and treatment, like just the reality of the physicality of this stuff. Pro-inflammatory milieu in combat-related PTSD is independent of depression and early life stress. So this inflammation, the success inflammation from the combat stress. So we have a map study that we're all here to, you know, hopefully one day participate in to some degree. So we've got the papers that they start publishing, you know, and then the durability, and then now reaching out to the military vets and the firefighters and the police officers and penetrating even the more conservative elements of our society. So we have PTSD, and I'm saying, well, PTSD is a disease of the emotional body. That's how we should think about it. And so it has their psychologic disturbance, that's obvious, the anxiety, the nightmares, etc. Neurologically, we have a lot of evidence that there's autonomic disturbance. And it's, it's high blood pressure and heart rate, you know, variability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's hormonal disturbance. We know about cortisol and adrenaline disturbances and PTSD. And there's inflammatory disturbance in the immune system. So the entire network, the psychoneuroendocrinologic network, which I'm calling the emotional body, is disturbed diffusely, and we know it's because of the trauma. There's no question. So, there's a PTSD case that I present in the book with Russ. He's a family friend of mine. He's a Vietnam vet that's been suffering, you know, with PTSD since Vietnam. So, for decades. And he had a huge breakthrough down in ayahuasca land. And he needed, like, a spiritual context and a, and a mystical setting. And he had an incredible, he had a lot of... Um, Energetic purging, you know, there was that, that is, that played a role, at least in that type of treatment. And he ended up getting into a lot of, like, very deep forgiveness work. Beyond just war, previous childhood trauma, etc. And he had a dramatic difference in his health. His diabetes and his high blood pressure reduced dramatically, you know, in response to unloading all that stuff, and then his PTSD symptoms and his relationships, and he was able to work things out with his kids and his wife, and you know, and he came back for more. It wasn't like everything was solved, but he, he, he made major progress after going to the VA for, you know, 40 years. Yeah. And talking about watching these young guys come in from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're looking across at this old guy, and they're saying, am I gonna be here for the rest of my life? You know? So it's, it's where we recognize, wow, we need to expand the paradigm. And there are other paradigms that are making a difference. But those paradigms acknowledge the emotional and spiritual dimensions of illness. Because PTSD is a disease of the emotional body. So what about the biochemistry? What about these energies? And so in the book I talk also about a lady uh, who came for migraine headaches, suffering with migraine headaches. And she had a big healing. And I didn't even know as a doctor, a family medicine doctor, I went to UCLA and all that kind of stuff. I and mean, we never talk about childhood trauma and migraines. Yeah. <laughs> that was not, not raised once. We sent them to the neurologist, you know, once they go through the, once they fail the protocol of whatever. And then they put them on meds, you know, and kind of hang. And not, and not that everybody's gonna respond so well, but it was interesting to consider that childhood trauma and healing childhood trauma was a reasonable approach in somebody with migraines where it's a sensory disturbance, where their sensory system is overwhelmed and they cross circuits and certain smells and certain sounds and certain light start putting them into the stress response. And, uh, and so in her case, she had a raging father. There was a lot of screaming and yelling around her as a young child, a lot of uh, dramatic violent behavior. And so that's what her healing was about, was releasing that energy and then eventually learning how to forgive her father and have compassion for where he was at and why he was like that. And that led to an incredible response. She went from being debilitated from monthly migraines that were further you know, triggered by her, her menstrual cycle to not needing medication anymore and uh, just doing very, very well. So it was a pretty dramatic response as described in the book and I'm still in touch with her and she's doing well. Well, one night she was overwhelmed by the ayahuasca coming back from the bathroom and just plop down in the middle of the maloca and just, you know, and you go try to talk to her. Hey, you know, why don't you go back to your bed? Everyone's walking, you're gonna, they're gonna trip over you. She just looks at you with a like far away, 
and stare like, oh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay, she can't talk. And so then for us in our training and the way we do it, just like, you know, we're going to learn about what they do with people in this MDMA state. In our training, it's, we sing to them, you know, we sing Ikaro to help get the person through parts of the experience and to do deeper healing. And so I was singing to her, and then I had an experience in my visions and the ayahuasca, and the ayahuasca showed me, it showed me this, uh, her chromatin. Her chromatin is like the DNA wrapped around the protein packaging that stores it. So it looks something like that. And it showed me this little black dragon that was swimming through like the nooks and crannies of her uh, chromatin. And the ayahuasca said to me, he said, Joe, her problem is not, because you hear, oh, it's the migraines, it's like DNA, it's in her family, her dad had migraines, you know, it's, it's genetic. And, and whatever, depression is genetic, and anxiety is genetic, and, you know, alcohol is genetic. <laughs> and, uh, and it says her problem is not in her genes, it's on her genes. And it was this dragon swimming around over, it's like, sing out the dragon, sing the dragon out. You know, clear the dragon out of her genes. It's floating on there. And it's hurting her. It's affecting the way her body's functioning. So, this is the epigenes. This is chromatin. This is what epigenetics is, you know, as we're touching on it. And so the epigenetics is the way that surround, it's what sits on top of the genes. The way certain things can get tagged and labeled and kind of affected, imprinted that machinery that sits on top of the genes, that's at the interface between the DNA code and the world, and the environment, and the way the environment affects the way that code's gonna be expressed. And so there's imprinting, there's little biochemical magic that happens, that the stories of these traumas get put down there. And that's a huge area of biology and medicine right now that's really a focus in cancer. Epigenetics is, is major. Cancer, all the environmental illnesses. Cancer is a very environmental illness. You know, it's understated, very understated reality. Where does the cancer come from? Where is the cancer coming from? And Fukushima happens, and we better get the hell out of here. Everyone's going to get cancer. So autoimmune illness. A lot of autoimmune illness is showing a lot of epigenetic um, contribution. Diabetes, diabetes type two has been brought up. We're talking about it. Then mental health, that anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction, all these things, that there's a major epigenetic role. And so, you know, these are just papers I just found when I was doing research on migraine, maladaptive brain response to stress, you know, no one ever brought that up to me. Childhood maltreatment in the migraine patient, 2016. Epigenetic mechanisms in migraine, a promising avenue. Epigenetics in migraine, complex, mitochondrial interaction, curbing disease susceptibility. So it was a reality, you know, like I heard this from the ayahuasca, and I have my research background, did a little research, and I was like, oh wow, it's true, you know. Hmm. So this is epigenetics, the dragon. And so she had her big healing that I talked about, you know, in the ceremony, and it was, like I said, it was all about purging this trauma, this stress energy, and releasing it, and healing her childhood, and forgiving her father at a very profound level. And it led to a shift in her migraine headaches. She didn't really have migraines after that. So Ricardo, you know, when we talk about the traditional perspective, so Ricardo's teaching us like how to work with these people. That's the whole treatment down there in New I was guided by the Shipibos. I'm just like the medical consultant. So he says, well, we need to clean the energies of their traumas. That's what we're doing. We're cleaning the energies of their traumas. And um, their strong experiences, strong emotional experiences that they went through, they get that's there. We have to clean that. And she was a soa, soa. That's clean. You know, limpia in Spanish. So these energies from in utero experiences where there's a lot of epigenetic evidence. From their infancy and childhood, a lot of epigenetic influence. Adolescence, adult life, our environment, our relationships, our ancestors, our family. So ancestral stuff as well. I'm going to speed through this, but there's just like early life trauma, depression, and the glucord, the cortisol receptor gene, epigenetic perspective. Epigenetic stuff about child uh, maltreatment in young monkeys and the way that the epigenetic imprinting stays with that and leads to lifelong anxiety problems from childhood. Like we say, it's software, not hardware. It's 
said epigenetics is the dragon in software, not hardware. Software has the potential to be healed. This kind of treatment can heal that software. So ancestral trauma, you know, intergenerational tra transmission of stress in humans. So this is becoming an area of epigenetic interest. And they did research on Holocaust survivors and their kids and the way epigenetic trauma comes down ancestrally, as the traditional healers have been saying forever. We know that epigenome responds to antidepressants, to software. We know it responds to parental love or the lack of love with this trauma. We know that meditation, altered states of consciousness, can influence the epigenetics. A lot of evidence of this now. We know that psychotherapy can actually affect the epigenetics, and there's published research. And I'm saying probably all kinds of emotional and energetic healing techniques, including in our case, you know, hikaros, can help heal that kind of stuff. Here's a couple of papers, HPA access related genes in response to psychological therapies, genetics and epigenetics. It's the topic, psychotherapy and genetic neuroscience in emerging dialogue. It is concluded that although the evidence is still limited at this stage, extant research does indeed suggest that psychotherapy may be associated with epigenetic changes. So Ricardo's saying, we gotta clean the energies, we gotta clean the energies, help them clean the energies. And what we're gonna learn as we watch these videos and go, and you're gonna watch people, guide people and hold them right up to these energies and let them finish out. Let this thing that got stuck, let it finish and let it leave. And it's about their feeling and their spirit and their minds just reflecting, telling stories about what it was. But once the energy goes, they feel different, they react different. So I'm saying psychedelic therapy is healing hearts and souls, you know, what we were hearing from Jamila, heart and soul, by healing the emotional body, this P and I network that I'm talking about, and the epigenome. That's an area where spirit touches the flesh, that's an area we can measure it, we can talk about it, and expand our paradigm to start reaching into the spirit. So we have the Modern Spirit Epigenetics Project, which is an epigenetics analysis of the MDMA assisted psychotherapy trial. So Modern Spirit, our organization has teamed up with USC and with MAPS. So we're raising money on modernspirit.org if you want to help us to collect saliva. It's time, two minutes. Good. Collect saliva on the people going through the trial that we're all participating in to look for changes in their epigenes, look at changes in their cortisol receptors and all that stuff that we know when PTSD heals it changes. And we know that when people are traumatized a certain way, the epigenes change. So to show the power of emotional and spiritual healing and the biological, the bio, yeah, biological reality of that. To show people, to demonstrate the value of spiritual healing in modern healthcare. So that's the Modern Spirit Epigenetics Project. We're looking for more support. Please help us. And that's it. That's ModernSpirit.org. Thank you.